from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Mr. Prado? Alvarado quiere un biscotto. Alvarado quiere un biscotto. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't understand Spanish. Mr. Atwell said... <coughs> and Alvarado, my parrot, does not understand English. <laughs> that makes you even, eh? <laughs> oh, you say Atwell? Senor Matthew Atwell? Yes. He's my father-in-law. <laughs> that is, he will be. <laughs> I'm Jerry Spencer. Miguel Ricardo Don Santos Prado at your service. Uh, please do sit down. I'm down here on a visit. Mr. Atwell said to be sure to see you. Ah, uh, Senor Atwell buys much coffee from me. Please to sit down. Ah. Ah. Hmm. Lesson number one is finished. So, you wish to know something about coffee, eh? Yes, sir. Mr. Ratwell said there's beauty and romance and adventure in the story of coffee. And literature and, and history, too. The, the story of coffee, eh? It is well, Jerry Spencer. So we come now to lesson number two. Story of coffee. You have not heard how coffee is discovered? <laughs> there are many legends, but this one I like very much. There was once a time when no one knew about coffee. It is hard to think of such a time, no? <laughs> ah, must be a very, very sad world then. Well, at such a time in Arabia, there was a young fellow named... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Kaldi, see, who sat under a tree all day and watched a small bunch of goats. Oh, it was very unexciting until one day... Such dull company. Thank you. 
run with this uncoat like prancing. How can I such conduct explain? For if mine own eyes see you dancing, by the beard of the prophet, I'm not sane. Do do the cherries. Do do the cherries. Do the cherries. Do the cherries. Do the cherries. Upon the coffee tree. Upon the coffee tree. Tree. I ate them. We ate them. We ate them. And oh, they made me happy as can be. And me. And me. And me. And me. And me. The babies feel so happy that we dance about in glee. The coffee cherries. The coffee cherries. It seems incredible, but maybe it's true. I'll try them myself. I'm feeling so blue. They may do for me what they've done for you. Cherries do not have as much power as that. <laughs> and how well Caldy and his goats dance, too. <laughs> there is much dancing in the history of coffee. In the coffee houses of Constantinople were told the stories of Arabian Nights, stories of Shehrazade. In the ballet of Shehrazade, there is a dance of the prince. And prince. in motion. Poetry. <laughs> He's a poetry and coffee, too. There was a time when we were like clubs, where big poets and writers came like Oliver Goldsmith and Samuel Johnson and people of the theater like David Garrick and the great actress Mrs. Siddons. And other people listened while they talked. Ah, it must have been great times to sit around the big table and drink coffee and see great men and hear stories which the whole world would hear one day. And would you believe it, my dear fellow, 
he did not know me. But did you tell him you were the great actor, David Garrick? I bade him look upon me. There was no need for taking my name in vain. <laughs> Shh, here comes Dr. Johnson. Johnson? It's Samuel Johnson. Here comes Sam Johnson. And Boswell, as usual, at his heels. <laughs> Gentlemen. <coughs> Gentlemen. <coughs> How do you do? <coughs> my dear Oliver Goldsmith, I ask pardon for my tardiness. <coughs> In truth, young Boswell here is much too good a listener. I had no mind of the time. Your apologies, my dear Johnson, fall on ears unheeding. I've scarce noticed your absence. What with sipping coffee, so delicious, hmm, to say nothing of a free seat at a performance of the great Garrick yonder. <coughs> and David is a pretty lad. It is sad that where such beauty reigns, uh, seems not a welcome place for brains. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Pray make no note of that, Boswell. The rhyme's not bad, but the meter's faulty. <coughs> I went my coffee. Did you think I came to... You come to be listened to, I'll be bound. Coffee may please you, but talk's your bread and meat. <laughs> You're a pert, miss. Away with you. Tis the ears on your cup that'll listen to your talk, not mine. <laughs> Egad, I think I'll give that to posterity. <laughs> ah, Mrs. Siddons. Mrs. Siddons, the actress. Oh, Mrs. Siddons, what does she oh, hear? Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Ah, my dear Mrs. Siddons. You do me too much honor to seek me out here. Samuel Johnson, you promised me a play. You will not escape me in a coffee house. Siddons is no disdainer of coffee. Have me a cup and a chair. I wish coffee for the lady. <coughs> and as for a chair, <coughs> surely a seat not fit for greatness and beauty, but will be a throne if you do sit upon it. <laughs> I'm afraid you're as flattering to this hardwood bench as to me. I trust you may be as flattering to the coffee. That is, when it comes. What's this? No coffee? I wait. Coffee for my lady. <coughs> hurry, hurry. Coffee. I'm coming, I'm coming. Here, let me have it. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Poor girl has fallen before so much greatness and loveliness all in one person. Was too much for her. <laughs> La, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of history in coffee houses, too. The French Revolution began in a coffee house. The American Revolution had lots of plans made for it in coffee houses. On the night of April 18th, 1775, the ride of Paul Revere was perhaps being planned in the Green Dragon Coffee House in Boston. James Otis was there, John Adams, and a young friend of Paul Revere. They talked very quietly about the coming of British soldiers. Ah, senor, it was a very, very bad time. Gentlemen, I have asked Paul Revere to meet us here tonight. I've had news. Two brigades of redcoats have been ordered to move against us at once. When, Mr. Adams? That I don't know, Mr. Otis, nor by what road. But the situation is desperate. 
We must resist now or never. You have no question of which it will be? None. The Minutemen have settled that. But we've got to know when they'll strike and where. We haven't a chance otherwise. I wish young Revere would get here. He'll be here, Mr. Otis. He promised to meet me here by 10 o'clock at the latest. Here he is now. It's Paul. I'll let him in. Paul! Thank heaven you've arrived. What have you learned? Not enough. But this much. They're ready to march tonight. How will they come? I haven't yet learned. Their ship, the Somerset, is still anchored in the bay and no sign of activity. They may come by land. We've got to know. It would be suicide to try to stop them unprepared. We will know. And you shall help me. I'm ready. Where do we go? You go to the tower of Old North Church. The commands of yours, the barracks. Watch carefully. Have two lanterns with you in the belfry arch of the tower. When you see which way they are to come, hang out a signal light. One lantern if they come by land, two if they leave by sea. But Paul, what good will that do? There still will not be time. My horse and I will be on the other shore ready to start the moment I see the light. I will arouse the countryside if I have to call on the crack of doom to help me. I'm off. Wish me luck. With thy blessing, O Lord. So, Jerry Spencer, coffee and coffee houses played a big part in the history of the whole world. And so we finish lesson number two. And tomorrow we start lesson number three, how coffee is grown. <laughs> Dios mio, Alvarado say it will be tomorrow pretty quick. <laughs> Ah, it is long past time for bed. Come, Jerry Spencer, mi amigo. We will leave this story of coffee until tomorrow. Now the house is this way. Come. Lesson number three, how coffee is grown. Here is the fazenda of Miguel Ricardo dos Santos Prado. What you would call a coffee plantation. Now here, there are one million trees. One million? Oh, you think it is many. <laughs> Some fazendas have 50, 60 million trees. Gosh, why doesn't seem possible? Yet there is not one tree planted here where they are grown. Here, see on these carts are small trees from the nursery where they were grown maybe one year till uh, it is maybe 18 inches high. See? Then if it is a good tree, it is transplanted here like bees in the orchard. Then how soon does it bear fruit? Coffee cherries appear on the trees in three or four years. You mean you leave them alone for three or four years before you start picking? <laughs> leave them alone? <laughs> they are raised like babies. <laughs> there must be no weeds. There must be all strong branches. There must not be too much sun. It takes a lots of people lots of time till the trees produce and cherries can be picked like these. So this is how coffee beans are picked. <laughs> It is not a bean. It is a cherry. Cherry? Well, I thought you'd call them that as well, sort of a grower's name. Oh, oh, no, no. It is a cherry. Wait.
See? Inside the cherry is the coffee bean. Uh-huh. I see. There's a bean in every cherry, is that it? Well, sort of like the uh, cherry pit. <laughs> there are two beans in each cherry. Here. I'll open it and uh, show you. But that cherry isn't ripe yet, is it? <laughs> it is ripe. If it is not ripe, it is not picked. Well, there are still flowers on that tree. How can there be ripe fruit on it? Oh, it is sometimes so. Here is a flower, a green cherry, a ripe cherry. And they are all on the same tree. Pickers must pick only cherries that are ripe. To pick a whole tree takes maybe, oh, six months. See? Then uh, what happens to the ripe cherries? Well, in a vat, the cherries are soaked in water until they get soft. The soft cherries go in the big machine where they are squeezed a little bit, and the coffee bean comes out the poop, <laughs> like that. <laughs> the coffee bean is washed clean. Then it is dried, dried in a big open place in the sun. Now, go this way over there, and you will see. I will come in four or five minutes. Señor, no pises sobre los granos de café. Speaking to me, mister? <laughs> Son tu idiota, le dije que no pises sobre los granos de café. Anda, fuera de aquí, anda, fuera, fuera, ¿qué le pasa? Oh, oh, what, what is happening here? Perdóname, señor Miguel, pero le dije al americano que no pisara sobre los granos de café. Y no puso nada de atención, quería pisar sobre los granos. <laughs> What's it all about, anyway? <laughs> He says to you, do not walk on the coffee. And right away you walked. It made him angry. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought he was calling to me. Sorry, mister. <laughs> bueno, muy bien. Adios. Now, Jerry, over here, we continue our lesson. Now you see, here the beans are dried. They must be turned over many, many times in the sun. It takes maybe four, six, or eight days. And when the beans are dry, then are they ready for market? No, they are not quite ready yet. For, uh, you see, the bean still has a coat-like parchment. See? In the warehouse, it goes into a big machine where it is rubbed, and the parchment coat falls off. <laughs> After this, the coffee must be cleaned, sorted, and in size and in grade. Then it is packed and is ready for market. <laughs> so, Jerry Spencer, we finish lesson number three, how coffee is grown. Now, in different places, it is grown different ways. It is picked different ways. It is dry, clean, sorted different ways. But in all ways, coffee makes lots of people happy. And it will make you happy too, I think. Well, I hope so. It's certainly given me a pleasant visit here with you. What's that? Oh, that is the whistle of the river boat, which tomorrow is to take you to big boat, which will take you home. <laughs> You will like that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I'm going to miss you a lot, Miguel. Well, it's been marvelous, and someday soon I'm expecting to see you in New York. Oh, oh, someday I will come. But when one leaves with coffee all of one's lifetime, he sees all of the world. For in all of the world is coffee. Adios, mi amigo. Matthew 
quite well. Hello, Miguel. I didn't know you came back with Jerry. <laughs> I had to come back. I have to learn the lesson number four. Lesson number four? That is right. Number one, two, three. Jerry has learned from Miguel. Lesson number four, Miguel must learn from Matthew Atwell. <laughs> yes, of course. But what is lesson number four? How coffee is blended, roasted, and the back. You will show Miguel. Uh, no. <laughs> I will show Miguel, yes, by all means. Come on, and, uh, may we come too, Mr. Atwell? Yes, Daddy, please. Eh, what? what? Hello, you two. For, for a minute, I thought it was... <clears throat> now, run along, you two. The plant's out that way. Come on, Miguel. Let's go. Green coffee starts on its last journey from this large storage room, where it was brought directly from the dock warehouse. And there it goes into the green coffee chute. Down this chute go the bags of coffee that go to make a full blend. A bag of this variety, three bags of another, two bags of a third, whatever the blend may be. Down the chute into a huge mixer and cleaner to get rid of any dust that the coffee may have picked up in its long journey. Thoroughly mixed and cleaned, it comes up this conveyor to the receiving hopper at the top of the roaster, where an automatic scale weighs out just the required amount for each roasting. When the roaster is ready for a new batch of green coffee, the operator, or roaster man, releases the green coffee in the hopper above. And here it is pouring down in a green stream into this huge drum-like oven. The roasting process lasts from 15 to 18 minutes, depending on the type of coffee. The coffee beans are continually tossed around the heating unit so that each bean is evenly roasted. While the roasting is nearing completion, it is carefully examined by an expert operator. And just at the right time, he rolls up this large cooling bin, flips up the spill chute, and there you have the roasted coffee in the well-known brown coffee bean. Now I want to show you what roasting does to coffee. See here. Now, here's what that bean looked like when it was green. The roasting process brings out all the delicate flavor-giving qualities in the coffee bean, the fragrant elements that give coffee its distinctive flavor. The coffee beans expand. Aromatic vapors are released. The bean, as you see, is literally blown up to more than twice its green size, with all the flavor and aroma of the coffee imprisoned inside. Keeping this goodness which has been created fresh is part of the coffee packer's problem. Because the moment air comes in contact with the coffee bean, they start to lose their strength. And if air continues to reach them, they eventually become stale and flat. In a little while, you'll see how we've solved that problem. By packing this coffee, within a very short time after it's roasted and ground, in vacuum cans. Cans, that is, from which the air has been removed and so preserve the freshness of the coffee until it's opened in the home. And now, over there, the coffee is cooling and ready for grinding. Here it is going into a huge bin, after which it passes into this grinder. Before grinding, the coffee goes through ingenious cleansing mechanisms that remove every particle of foreign matter and leave only the pure coffee that pours down this chute into the packing department on the floor below. And here comes the coffee to its last operation, weighing and packing in vacuum cans. No hands touch either can or coffee from the time the can starts its journey until it's filled, sealed, and ready for packing in cases. There go the cans, each filled with exactly the right amount of freshly ground coffee. Then out they go to make room for another batch of four cans while the fill cans pass on to a clincher where the cover is loosely attached. And right here comes the very important contribution of modern science to the enjoyment of coffee, packing in vacuum cans. After the covers are put on, 
the can enters this chamber and just before the cover is hermetically sealed onto the filled can, an ingenious suction device draws the air out of the can, leaving the freshly roasted coffee surrounded only by its own elements and no air to rob it of its flavor and aroma. So here we come to the end of the coffee packing story. The end of lesson number four, Miguel. With freshly roasted coffee still retaining all its delicious quality in a can that keeps it that way. Here, let me show you. Here it is, the perfect container for good coffee. Well, where have Don and Jerry gone? Maybe they have gone back to the office. <laughs> I think maybe Jerry Spencer wonders if Matthew Atwell thinks she is good enough to be his son-in-law. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.